Welcome to Crime Most French, a weekly podcast taking you through intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Research and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open le vin and let the mayhem commence. The case this week is that of Eugene Weidmann or Wiedmann. He is a German-born petty criminal. He quickly escalates to murder in the 1930s just so that he could rob the victims. He is eventually caught and executed in 1939. And that story has importance for two reasons. One, one, it is historically significant. We'll see why towards the end. And two, it has a celebrity connection. Eugene was born on the 5th of February 1908 in Frankfurt. So last week we had a Frenchman who died off of French soil. I take it this week we've got a non-French person dying on French soil, or at least being convicted on French soil. Yes. And dying there too, yeah. Mm-hmm. He is brought up by his grandparents in Cologne. This is because his father was called for the First World War. Mm. So his parents couldn't would bring him up. So he grew up with his grandparents. I guess that would have been quite common. That the, would have been very common, yeah. I would uh, think so. That time of year, as opposed to that time of day, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. As a teenager, he ends up in prison in Bergdem, Dern, in Germany. Don't know how to say it after having stolen a watch in a local swimming pool locker. So he obviously starts quite young then. He starts quite young, yeah. And he starts getting caught quite young. As a young adult, he leaves Germany and he immigrates to Canada where he continues his criminal activities. Okay. He spends some time in prison again and he's sent back to Germany in 1931. So again, he was caught. So the, the Canadians obviously don't want criminals in there. No. Country. Well, that's probably the case still. In some cases, when you have a, if you're caught for criminal activity, you're sent back to wherever you come from. Mm. And it still happens. But anyway, he's really not good at not getting caught. Yeah, he does seem rather inept. <laughs> yeah. Pretending to plan to create a taxi company in Germany, he convinces his parents to buy him a car because his parents were fairly well off. Okay. But the real plan is to use the car for kidnappings. He's planning to abduct some rich hair, it doesn't matter, uh, man, woman, whoever has money. Mm-hmm. But the plan fails because he can't plan properly. <laughs> he just did it wrong. Plan to fail, fail to plan. Eh? Yeah. So oh, no, again, I said the wrong way, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, fail to plan, plan to fail. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So again, he's arrested and he's sentenced to five years and eight months in prison this time. So it's quite long. Mm. In prison in Frankfurt, he meets two French guys who had been arrested for money uh, trafficking. They were selling fake Dutch mark. Okay. They're called Roger Million and Jean Blanc, or Jean Le Blanc, depending on where you look. They get along very quickly because the two French guys and Eugene are the only three people who speak French in the prison. Ah, okay. So they bond over a common, common, common language. language. Mm. Also, Eugene organizes or facilitates things for them, so he makes their life in prison easier. I have no details about that, but this mentioned um, a lot later in the trial that one of the reasons why they followed him is that he made their life easier in prison by helping them do things or get things. Oh, I see. If we're going to equate it to anything fictional, I guess, what was he a bit like Red in uh, Shawshank Redemption? I guess so. <clears throat> Something like that. But I have oh. really no detail. Okay. Eugene is the first one to get out of prison. But he's taken out of prison by the Gestapo and questioned for three days and then released. And mm. that will be important later. That sounds very mysterious. It's very mysterious, yes. He spends six months with his parents in Frankfurt after leaving prison. Then mm. he moves to Paris where he meets his new two new accomplices on the 15th of May, 1937. In theory, he wasn't allowed to leave Germany because he was a criminal. But somehow he managed to cross the border unnoticed. I guess if you're going to kind of like be a thief, I guess crossing international borders is really not that much of a sidestep. It's really small potatoes in terms of a, of a career criminal. Yes. 
But what troubles the French police is that he could do it so easily and he, he shouldn't have been able to do that. So they're really worried that lots and lots of Germans might cross the border. Mm, I see. Because we are getting to the late 30s at that point. Mm. So the relationships between France and Germany are not very good. I, I was just thinking of the two uh, French guys that were in prison that were printing mm-hmm. marks. I mean, the inflation yeah. rates in Germany at the time would have been phenomenal. They must have had to yeah. be printing a lot of uh, money to, to make it. Well, they, they were caught in the uh, mid-30s because he was sent back to Germany in 1931. Mm-hmm. So, so that might have been still okay because the Weimar Republic was ended in 33. Mm. Might still have been okay when they were doing it. I don't, I don't, I don't have more details on, details on that. Mm, okay. The French police is also very worried about his visit to the Gestapo when he left prison. Mm. They are wondering if he was sent to France by the Germans to kill opponents to the Nazi regime or to kill Jews in France. So when he gets caught in France, it's one of their big worries. I guess I mean, it was very justifiable given the time. Yeah, 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 it would be, especially since there were lots of... Uh, of prominent Jews in some parties, for example, mm. um, that were running important things. So yeah. they were worried that they would be the target of yeah. a number of agents sent by Germany to assassinate people. So they really wanted to know. Mm. We're a bit ahead of ourselves here, but yes, yeah. that, that's something they will want answered when, yes. when he gets caught. And that's not really a spoiler. He will get caught, of course. <laughs> of course. Well, we wouldn't be discussing him if he hadn't got caught. Yeah, also it's so rubbish and not getting caught. That they, of course he will be. Yeah. So now that uh, Eugene has a gang, things can become a bit more serious. Okay. With his two accomplices and Jean Blanc's mistress, who was born René Victoire, she's a, she's a woman, but she married to a guy called Trico, that's his surname, and her nickname, because everybody had a nickname at the time, was Colette, who was a writer at the time. Okay. She even wrote about the case, by the way, in the newspaper, in one of the newspapers, I read her articles about it. I see. So she was covering the case. Oh, oh, those ladies, ladies that are obsessed with true crime, some things never change. Yeah, that's true. I didn't notice that, yeah. So they decided to go back to the kidnapping plan because mm-hmm. they thought, yeah, that's a good idea. We can do it better with three or four of us than Eugene on his own. Yeah, that's a good idea. But, uh, but, it, but this was obviously based in Paris, was it? It was based in Paris, yeah. yes. That's mm-hmm. where they all meet in thirty-seven. Okay. As it happens, the... Universal exhibition is also taking place at the same time in Paris. So it means there's a lot of fairly rich, not very aware people, tourists mostly, mm. walking the streets. Lots of pigeons. as well. Lots of pigeons, yeah. yeah. Lots of possible targets. Eugene manages to get in and blend in uh, the exhibition by pretending that he had been hired as an interpreter because he speaks English. So he speaks German, French and English. Mm. And nobody questions it, so he just walks freely around, and when he stopped, he says, yeah, I'm an interpreter, and that seems to work. The foolish thing is, he probably could have made quite a good living being an interpreter. He totally could have, yes. But like most criminals, even though they've spent... Lazy and greedy. Well, not necessarily lazy. Lots of criminals spend a lot of time and resources doing bad things, Mm. and they would be probably well off if they did the right thing instead. But they just don't want to do that. Weidmann rents a house in Celle saint cloud which is west of Paris, okay. under the name Carreur, or Carreur, I don't know how to say it. Okay. The group also spends time in that house. As far as I know, none of them lived there full time, because they all, all, all had their own house, okay. but they spent time in that house as well. So it's just like a base. Yeah, and they were planning to take the abduction victims to the house okay. to keep them for as long as the ransom hasn't been paid. Yeah. At some point, it's not entirely clear what happened to Eugene, because until then he had never been properly violent. He had never attacked anybody, never killed anybody. Okay. And suddenly things change, and we really don't know why, and he can't explain it. The first person they abduct is on the 23rd of July, 1937. It's an American dancer called Jean de Coven. She arrived for the Paris exhibition right. via the Normandy. And she meets Eugene in uh, the bar of the Ambassador Hotel, which is one of the big hotels in Paris. And they hit it off quite quickly because she finds him attractive. So he chats her up. And 
because she's a tourist and she doesn't know anything outside the US, she wants to see everything in Paris. Of so course. he offers to guide her through Paris. So she well, says, oh, what, yes. What person would uh, not like to be led around uh, a city by somebody who knows it? Yeah, I guess mm. so. So he manages to get her to the rented house. Originally, he pretended to want to pick up his car, but she wanted to see the house anyway because she wanted to see everything. Oh, how do the French Everything was exciting. Live? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She wanted to mm-hmm. see absolutely everything around Paris she could see. So it had no problem getting her into the house. Okay. Then there are several accounts of what happened. One of them is that he walked behind her getting into the house and he suddenly decided to strangle her. He put his hands around her neck and started to strangle her. She fought back. She, he had to fight her to the ground by hitting her with his knees. Yeah. He made a tourniquet with a towel that was there to strangle her more. Okay. And she took a long time to die. Eventually, she lost consciousness. She, mm-hmm. He puts his handkerchief in, in her mouth and continued strangling her until she died. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? Um, when you're strangling somebody, it's, it's not the 30-second the uh, easy death that it looks on Hollywood screens. It's, it's, a, it's an up personal, close, and very painful, slow death. Yeah. That's the story that was in the newspapers when he was just arrested, so before anything else was leaked out or before the trial. Okay. But there's, um, we'll see later there's different stories about this. I'm, I'm presuming that as she was a tourist, it wasn't kind of like um, noticed that quickly that she was missing. Presumably not, no. No, especially given the communications at the time. Mm. It possibly would have been weeks before anybody started asking questions, I assume. Yeah. He said that she was giggling and laughing all the time until she died, essentially. Oh, God. And out of that, he steals $500 in traveler's check from her purse. That's not bad. That's not bad. It's really not that much for killing someone. Yeah, but I mean, it's $500 in the 30s. I mean, yeah, but that would be what, 5,000 euros or something today. So it's still not that much for killing someone. I think the exchange rate was, uh, I think the dollar was still quite strong in the 20s and 30s. Don't know. Anyway. But it's not, it's not presented as a massive sum in the newspapers okay, at the time right. anyway. Fair enough. He manages to spend it by copying her signature. Right. So he buys various things in shops. Mm. And he also attempts to extract more money from one of her aunts called Ida Sakaim. Mm. But she refuses and she doesn't pay anything. So that didn't go okay. anywhere. Okay, well, so a dead end. So that was the first victim. Right. There's five more after that. Oh, oh. It's not entirely clear until the trial how exactly the murders happened. It's not even clear who did the murders. In some cases, it's assumed that it's Eugene. Sometimes it's assumed that it's Million and Eugene. Sometimes Million. Nobody really knows at that point. Mm-hmm. Victim number two was Joseph Kufi, who was a driver. Uh, but think long distance, luxury driver, really. Okay. Like Uber. Mm-hmm. So you would rent him and his car for a long trip. Along, I don't know, you want to go to the south of France from Paris, just rent, rent, rent him in his car and he drives you there and this kind of stuff. So long, long distance luxury taxi or something. Yeah, I guess, I mean, vehicles were very expensive and uh, yeah. Yeah, they would a luxury been. at that time. Yeah, I can't remember the type. I've heard what the type was, but I can't remember. It wasn't a, a brand that exists anymore. Okay. So they steal 1,400 francs from him. Now that feels like a lot more. Well, a bit more. And they steal his car, and they put a bullet in his head. Mm. On the 4th of October 1937, Janine Keller, who was a divorced maid, is hired through a newspaper ad, and she's an ex-victim. Does it? It's a bit of a strange <laughs> shout going from kind of like wealthy dancer, uh, somebody who has their own business and stealing their assets, to a maid. Yeah, I don't think they were that very choosy. They just took whatever they found. So she probably put an ad in the newspaper saying, I'm a maid, I can clean your house. And they said, yeah, come to our house and shot her, mm. essentially. To more of an opportune. It's just easy. Yeah, an opportune that, one rather yeah. than going looking for well, it. I don't think they were planning much, really. They no. were just taking what they could when they could. Mm. They kill her in the Fontainebleau Forest, which is east of Paris. Yeah. Mm. From a bullet in the head again. And so that, that becomes obviously the preferred MO rather than It, it does, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. seems to be the way they want to do things. 
And they bury her in a cave. There's lots of caves in Fontainebleau. And it's eventually found, and there's lots of photos of the investigation and excavations mm. and everything in the newspapers at the time. That's sad. Yeah, it just feels sad being put in a cave. Well, she's dead. It doesn't really matter at that point. But no, but it just It's more sad. sad that she was killed. Well, yes, of, co- of course. On the 16th of October 1937, so we're talking not even two weeks later, Roger Leblanc, who was an agent for artists, is looking for investors to create a theatre troupe. So she, he's looking for people who want to invest into a theatre. Okay. He publishes an ad in the newspaper, and they find the ad, and they lure him to the house, and they kill him in the house. His body is later dumped in a quiet street in Neuilly, which is also west of Paris, so not far from the house. And from him, they steal 5,000 francs, because it was previous investors' money. Ah, right, okay. So that's uh, obviously quite a good haul. They didn't know at the time, obviously. It's no, they total, just got lucky. Total luck, yes, mm. that the guy had money. All they yeah. saw is a newspaper ad, and the guy mentioned money. So, yeah, mm. okay, well, <laughs> we'll see what we can get out of him. That's, that's all, really. But none of those is kidnapping. It's just murder at that point. Yeah. Murder for money. That's all they are doing. On the 20th of November, Fritz Frommer, who is a German Jew that Eugene met in prison, is also killed, also a bullet in the head, because... The gang was worried that he knew too much about what they were doing and uh. he might denounce them, so they didn't want to take the risk, but they okay. killed him. Snitches get bullets. Or snitches get stitches yes, and bullets in the head, yes. yes. <laughs> um, and they bury him in the cellar under the house. Okay, so there's two bodies now the buried West. under the... Yeah. Yeah, or under the Ed Gein or yeah. what, many of the other who bury uh, victims in their house. And finally, the last victim is Raymond Le Sobre who is an estate agent, and he's killed on the 27th of November, 1937. Mm-hmm. He tells his secretary that he's going to meet some clients who are apparently very interested in one of his houses, okay. and therefore he says that he'll be back very quickly because the deal would be no problem. Okay. Unfortunately, he doesn't come back, so when the evening comes, the secretary gets worried and calls the police. They search, search his office, and they found a card which, given where it was, was assumed to be the last person he talked to. Oh, right, okay. So they think, oh, that would be the murderer. Mm-hmm. So they trace who that person is. It's a person called Arthur Schott. Right. But he has a very good alibi because he was in Alsace at the time. So oh, not right. only he was quite far from Paris at the time, yeah. we we're talking hours of driving at yeah. the time. Now it's like two hours by train, but it yeah. would be hours of driving. And it was Germany. Ah, at the right, time okay. as well, so it yeah. was a different country. Mm. So it could easily prove that he hasn't cl- cl- crossed the border. Yes, yeah, so that's a solid alibi. That's a fairly solid alibi. But he mentions that his nephew, who was called Fritz Frommer, remember Fritz Frommer, victim yes. number five? <laughs> yeah, the guy in the basement. The guy, yes, and under the house, has a number of his business cards. Oh. So it could be that yeah. that's the way that one ended up in his office. Okay. So they tried to track down that guy, Fritz mm. Frommer, and they can't, they can't find him. Not so him. they, at, the, at that point, mount an operation to find who that guy is and where he is. Mm. At some point during that investigation, they find mentions of some of his acquaintances. One of them is a guy called Carrer. Uh, and so they trace the, that name. Yeah, that's the, guy, the name the Eugene used, isn't it? For yes, that's one house. of the made-up names yeah. that Eugene is using. Okay. So they trace him to the house that he's renting. So oh. early December, they go to the house. So the jig is up. On the 8th of December, yeah. So they ring the bell and a guy comes out, all relaxed and not thinking of anything bad, apparently. They explain to him, not wanting him to know why he's coming, just in case. You never know, he could have accomplices in the house and that could be bad. And he turns into a rabbit. Or it could turn bloody. So they tell him that they're tax people and they work for the tax office okay. and their task is to find who lives in the house just for tax reasons right and at that point Kara, who's white man doesn't seem to be worried at all he seems okay with that so he invites them in the police report say, says that he even took time to pet a dog a local dog when he when, went back to the house okay. so he's obviously really not worried once in the house he starts wondering, maybe, are they really who they say they are? So he asks them to show their card. 
And of course, the cops at that point are cornered because they yeah. don't have tax cards. No. They have police cards. Mm. So they show their police cards mm. and then he knows that they're not who they, they said they were. Yeah. And they want to know who he is to be sure because mm. that care guy is kind of fishy. So they want to know if it's him and if it's him, what's his real name. So you, they showed them their papers. Now you have to show. show yeah, they want him to show his. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So he reaches into his good to get his wallet but instead brings a gun back and gun out and <sighs> starts shooting he manages to injure the two cops one is shot in the shoulder the other one has his skull grazed by the bullet they start fighting one of the cops was an ex-wrestler so he has a small advantage but the big problem they have is that neither of them has a gun so the two cops are called Poignant and Bourquin okay. and they have zero gun among them so they are now fighting against a guy who has a gun and they don't have any. So the ex-wrestler is wrestling with Eugene, yes. I guess. Getting him to the ground, but then yeah. what? And exactly. And he sees on the table a hammer. So he takes the hammer and just hits Eugene on the head once. And wow. that's enough. He's just out. Okay, that was blunt and to the point. So he's arrested and he's taken to the, the police station. Okay. He is interrogated for a very short while, and that's pretty much just enough to explain to him what they want and why they arrested him. Okay. They have found the car of the estate agent. Right. They have found the car of the driver. They have found a gold cigarette lighter with initials RL, and that's Raymond Le Sobre. Okay. Most likely. That was his initials. And two illegal guns in the house. So he knows they found all that. So th things are starting to not look good. So, yeah, it's hard to deny that something's fishy, something fishy yeah. is not happening in the house. Yeah, yeah. But he says he's tired, so he doesn't want to be interrogated on that day. So he t tells them to come back the next day and <laughs> he will talk to them. And they do, which is wow. really weird because yeah. I would have thought the... 30s police would not have been tender. Yeah. They would just have bitten him until he said whatever they wanted him to say. But no, apparently they say yes. Okay. They go back the next day. Yeah. I would have been worried to let him go to sleep just because, I mean, you're not telling me he didn't have some kind of con uh, concussion after receiving a blow to the head. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I've, because he was the bad guy, there's very little concern for him. Oh, of course. In the, in the press, there's photos with him with blood, blood everywhere and bandages on his head. Yeah. But nobody really cares about that. So there's no mention no. of anything. <laughs> no, I mean, if you've murdered five people, the, the, the you know, getting a boo-boo. Six, yeah. oh, six people, yeah, sorry. I mean, if you've got a boo-boo on your head, then yeah, nobody's really that worried. But I'd be more worried about uh, him slipping into a coma and dying. That's true. But again, in the 30s, that might not have been a big concern. I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah, I mean, I guess he could have been charged uh, posthumously anyway if he had died. But, uh, yeah, but remember, even until the 70s, people were not really considered at risk of suicide. So they would have their shoelaces left with them in the prison. And yeah. it's only a very recent thing that mm. we do that. So in the 30s, that might not even have crossed their yeah. mind that, yes, okay, he had a hit on the head, but uh, the Who what? cares? <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. But anyway, they come back the next day right. and he confesses the next day, okay. as he promised. So he confesses about absolutely everything. So he starts with the crimes he did when he was a kid in yeah. Germany. So all the pretty thefts he did. I then guess they're he, really not interested in that, uh, are they? Not that much, no. Then he talks about all his crimes in Canada. In Skip detail. to the end. Yeah. And then to about the crimes he did in Germany when he came back to Germany. Again, they don't care. No. But they're getting really impatient at mm. that point. So instead of letting him just talk about what he's done, which mm. is going to take forever, they start asking questions, and really what they want is solve the murder of the last victim, Raymond Le, Le Sobre, mm. the estate agent, because yeah. that's the one they are aware of. Yes. And they found reasons to think that he has done it. So he, he's asked about it, and he says that, yep, he did it. It just, ha just happened by chance. It wasn't the plan. Mm. He wanted money, and he just went into the first shop he saw when he was in the street and it happened to be an estate agent. Okay. So he thought, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do with that. So he took an appointment to see her house and he thought, yeah, I'm going to rob that guy. And that essentially, that's how it happened. It could have been anything else. It could have been a bakery. It could mm -hmm. have been anything else. Yeah. It just was closer to an estate agent. So Very no planning unlucky. whatsoever. Very unlucky. 
That was very unlucky for the, the estate agent, yes. Once in the house, he said that he arrived with his car, the car that they found at his house. Once in the house, he just decided to kill him and shot him in the head. And that was it. Essentially, no discussion. Yeah. He also confesses to the murder of Jean Coven, the first one, the American dancer. Another dancer, yeah. He, the police at that point can't believe their ear because they've been trying to find a lead for five months on that murder and they had nothing whatsoever. They really had nothing. Mm. And suddenly there's that guy who says that it was him. Mm. So he that explains good. that, yeah, he met her in the bar and everything and he convinced her to go and visit Paris, but first go via the house. Yeah. And he just strangled her, but he doesn't really know why. One version is the one I mentioned earlier, that he just decided to strangle her when she walked into the house. Another right. one is that they spent the evening together, drunk a lot. He drugged her. And when he woke up in the morning, he found her looking through his pockets. And he knew he had a gun in there, so he decided to kill her before she killed him. Oh, I see. Trying to justify it. Trying to justify it, yes. And that version seems to be a, l a bit less mm. likely given the other murders. Yeah, no, that doesn't sound like But that's the one he gives the, the cop, and that's the cops, and that's the version that's used in the trial. Mm. It really doesn't matter. The fact no. is he confessed that he killed her. Anyway. Exactly. That murder seems to have affected him because when he tells the story, he cries every time and he absolutely refuses to go back to the house. He tells the cops that he buried her under the patio of the house and he didn't dig very deep, so it would be easy to get her out. <laughs> so they're probably glad for that. Yeah. But that, that's what I said. It's a very, uh, very up close and personal way to kill someone. I mean, you're looking Strangling, right yeah. in their eyes. When they, mm. Unless you're doing, as you say, he's got the tourniquet and he's doing it from behind. But I don't know the details. I know there was a tourniquet involved, but I don't know if he was at the back or not. Well, you can do it anywhere you want. So. Yeah, well, obviously gave him P mild PTSD if he can't talk about it yes. without crying about it. So. Well, the, the, the cops are really surprised. Mm. Some of them don't believe him. They believe that it's just an act. But mm. the main guy in charge uh, believes him. He actually believes that, yes, he's yeah. just really sad about it, which is weird. But Yeah. But that no. seems to have been the first murder, so I'm thinking maybe that's, that triggered something and he snapped and then that was it. it. it was, he didn't care about killing other people at yeah. that point because he had never killed anyone before. I mean, it made him sad, but not st sad enough to not kill anyone else. Well, he was sad about that murder, yeah. not about the others, no. no. He never showed, showed any, any remorse for killing five other people. It's no. just her. That's the only one that he regrets. So then he describes all the other murders to the cop. Mm-hmm. But he refuses to give the name of his accomplices. So at the moment, they only have him. But okay. they know that he wasn't alone. They learn who was involved with him, with him via various witnesses and various um, pieces of evidence. So they start a nationwide manhunt for, to find them. Right. But before that can go anywhere, one of the accomplices, Jean Blanc or Le Blanc, um, who had a bit of money, I think he narrated it, talks to his lawyer because he learns about that manhunt in the press. Okay. In fact, in fact, no, I think his lawyer calls him. And his lawyer tells him, yeah, you're not going to escape. You need to go back to Paris and surrender because they will find you, they will kill you. Okay. So they all go back to Paris and they all surrender. Well, so that was all very easy, wasn't that it? That was very easy, yes. And they would never have been found because they were in Savoie in the middle of nowhere in the countryside in the mountains. They oh, could yeah. have stayed there for years. Or could have done, yeah. But... They were worried that the police would just then just try to kill them, not yeah. arrest them, which would probably have been the case. Yeah, we've sure. seen it, for example, with the uh, Carlos um, in the seventies, when the police was tired of hunting him. Strangely, he was shot in the street by a gang at the back of a van. Mm -hmm. mm. So yeah, I suspect the police would have just tried to kill them at that point. So they mm. knew that, so they surrendered. So yeah, that was easy. Sh shoot, shoot first, ask questions later. Oh yeah, at that point, yeah. So the, the police organize searches in the house and various other places. They find papers belonging to the victims, for example, car registration papers, bank receipts uh, in the name of some of the victims, a wallet. They find also the Coven's checkbook. That's the dancer. And they find lots of things all neatly sorted in a, in a metal box. <laughs> Is it in filing cabinets and by name? Yeah, essentially. <laughs> yeah. They also find lots of ID papers in various names, like William Dixon, Eugene Keller, Eugene Carra, Eugene Brown, all with Eugene's photo. So they're all fake right. papers. So they know that he has connections to, to get these papers done. 
and they learn during the trial that it's the same contact that allowed him to cross the border from uh, Germany to France right. in 1937 and provided him with all these papers. I mean, let's face it, if you're in prison, you're going to have a network of Yeah, of that's contact. pretty much what prison is for, yeah. yeah. It's the Facebook of uh, criminals. <laughs> yes. At that point, they still don't know why he's in France and they don't know why he went via the Gestapo offices and they mm. question him. And all he does is laugh and say, that's just normal. The Gestapo does it to everybody. So, and yeah. somehow the French services didn't know. So I find that strange. Too. That's weird. Yeah, I find that, that strange and hard to believe, but that seems to be what he's saying. Well, none of the victims weren't um, particularly targeted because of their religion or no. No, no. nationality. So. No, but they don't know if he killed other people. He no, confessed to six murders, but who, for all we, they know there might have been 30 or 40 more. That's well, true. They really don't know. So they think that maybe he's sent as an agent. So it could be that he was caught for his own activities, mm. his, like hobby. Yeah, but not for his... his but not for his, what was his, what was his job, essentially, yeah, yeah, yeah. as an assassin. So they, they don't mm. know, so they question him, but he doesn't say anything more. No. So it seems to be all there is. Mm. After about a year of inquiry in March 1939, they appear in court. That seems to be quite a long time. Normally, we, we get to the trial reasonably quickly after Well, it that. depends. We've had a case where the, the trials... Remember the woman who allegedly poisoned her husband and spent 20 years in various trials? Oh, yes. Yeah, so five right. trials. Yeah. And eventually was released because everybody was tired of it. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, it, sometimes it takes a long time. And remember, between two trials, there was 11 years. Oh, that was, a, that was the, art, the, the sign. Uh, the arsenic one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the the graveyard. Ago, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it, sometimes it takes time. Mm. Now, in this case, it was a, a year, which is shortish. Well, not I the guess, shortest I mean, it we've six, had. It was multiple, so six murders. So, yeah, I guess, yeah. I guess it's the one. Yeah, they need to gather evidence and make sure they mm. have what they need. Yeah. Even though they have confessions. But then what they really want is sort out who did what. Yeah. Because they don't know. The, Eugene has confessed to the murders, but they don't know if he did it on his own. They don't mm -hmm. know if, especially Millon was involved or not. Yeah. And Millon says that no, he wasn't involved. In some cases, he was there or he was in the next room, right. but he didn't do it. He didn't shot, didn't shoot anybody, didn't kill anybody. Eugene is a bit less clear about it, so they tried really to know who did what. Okay. And that's probably what took time. Yeah. The, the case is pretty high profile at that point. It's been in newspapers for mm. months. Yeah. So Eugene has no problem finding a lawyer. They all fight to represent him because, of course, if you represent him, you're in the newspaper. Uh, didn't, no connection to Laundrie's uh, lawyer, no. <laughs> he well, seems to be everywhere at that time. Yes. Um, Eugene was in the same cell Laundrie was when he was awaiting trial. Ah, okay. And no, his lawyer is not the same as Laundrie's lawyer. <laughs> okay. During the trial, psychiatrists who we interviewed Eugene described him as superior de degenerate, most likely because they found him intelligent, but he seems to be crazy, a psychopath or a sociopath. Okay. It, it's meaningless. Uh, I've seen an article published a few years ago by a modern psychiatrist saying that, that that's a meaningless name. It yeah. doesn't tell you anything about no. the guy. <laughs> not at all. So, but he's found fit for trial, so right. tri trial happens. On the 31st of March at midnight, the gang is found guilty and sentenced. Right. So Colette is acquitted, even though there's big doubts about her involvement. Okay. For example, at some point early in the case, they learn that some money was taken from the bank. I think it was from the coven. Her money was taken in exchange for money, the okay. Travis check. And it was done by a blonde woman who looked like her. And they have no idea who that person is. Mm. Eventually, Colette confesses that it's her with the wig. Okay. So they know he, she probably did a bit more than just being there. Mm. But they, didn't really, they, don't, they don't really care. They know she didn't murder anybody, so she just gets away with it. So she's acquitted. Well, they got bigger fish to fry. Yes. Jean Blanc receives 20 months in prison. 20 months? Wow. Yes, 20 months. But again, he... His involvement is to find victims and provide money for the gang. That's okay. about it. He wasn't involved in any of the murders. He wasn't involved in any of the scams. It was just around... He had money and obviously was bored. He must have been just thinking, oh, that's fun. Yeah. Let's get involved with the criminals. That's, and that's the only okay. reason I can see because he had plenty of money. Mm. Um, he lent, for example, 10,000 francs to Mion at some point. Okay, wow. Uh, it's just 
He had money. Yeah. When he was just there. So he didn't do anything, but he still got 20 months, so okay. maybe less than two years. Mion and Weidman are sentenced to death. Right. Not surprising. Later on, on the 16th of June, Roger Mion's sentence is committed to life in prison by the President of the Republic, Albert Lebrun. Okay. But he absolutely refuses to commute Eugene's sentence. So Eugene is going to be put to death. Right. I wonder if it was the, the first strangling that was the thing. That uh, it's out. probably the fact that he confessed to all six murders. Yeah. Whereas Mion, still at the time of the trial, refused to admit that he was involved in any of the murders. Okay. He says the closest he's been is the next room. Right. Allegedly sleeping. And they can't really find any evidence that he actually killed mm. someone, shot anybody, mm. strangled anybody at all. So it's just purely by association. Yeah. yeah. He still gets life. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it it's doesn't... Not nothing. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't get executed like uh, Eugene. No. Eugene's execution is scheduled for the 17th of June, 1939. So that's quick. Yeah. Because the appeal was rejected straight away. Okay. He will be executed in front of the prison in Versailles in the exact same spot where Landry was executed. Okay. The execution is a bit strange. There's, first of all, uh, confusion on the time. The prosecutor and the executioner seem to have not used the same time. One used legal time, the other one used solo time. Okay. Nobody was, not everybody was there at the time it was supposed to happen, so oh, no. it's late by at least 45 minutes, which means that instead of taking, taking place at dawn when it's barely light, mm. it takes place mid-morning, and then there's a massive crowd around. Oh, just as strange. Even though it wasn't allowed and it's always been banned, there's lots of photos and even a film that are made of the execution. Mm. You can find the video on YouTube. Grizzly. No thanks. After the execution, the crowd manages to overpower the security forces and women are seen dipping handkerchiefs in blood because apparently execution victims' blood is good for fertility. That is... That one is of very the craziest weird and disturbing. Things, that is just one of the craziest things I've ever heard. I mean, yeah. you, I, I could understand it if it was kind of like, you know, at the time of the revolution that the women were doing that, but in the 30s? Yeah. That's just crazy. Yeah. And for those who won't watch the execution, um, I watched it and I was really surprised by how efficient it, how efficient it is. In the video, you can see Eugene come out of the prison. He's wearing a white shirt that is torn around the neck. And I vaguely remember it matches the photos of Landry being executed. Same thing, he had a white shirt that was torn around the neck, so it must be something they do on purpose. I'm not sure he had shoes. It's not clear in the, in the video. Um, mm -hmm. We see him walk, being walked to the guillotine by two policemen. Then okay. he's pushed on the rotating board. Was, that's first vertical. Then he's on it, pushed horizontal. Oh, okay. So it lower, kind of like lowers you down. Yeah. Mm. Well, yes. You go from standing to yeah. horizontal mm. on that rotating board. Yeah. And then he's pushed towards the, the blade. Pushed into the blade, yeah. right. Okay. At that point, the executioner grabs his head and pulls the lever. The blade comes down, bounces twice, and that's it. <laughs> then his body is pushed back from, from the blade, pushed into a, a basket. That, that's waiting on the side. Okay. The head follows, basket closed, basket gone, and they clean the, the guillotine. It's just so quick. It, the whole execution, which is supposed to have been long, this one, mm -hmm. because there was a bit of confusion about how to do it, only took about 12 seconds. Good Lord. It is so fast. And then they take the guillotine apart in minutes mm -hmm. and then clean the, clean the streets, and by lunchtime, it's like nothing happened. It's really, really strange to see that. I think I'll go to my grave. <laughs> Not seeing it. <laughs> Not seeing it, if you don't mind. So he's buried into a non-marked grave in the local cemetery. Mm -hmm. A woman who was writing to him when he was in prison manages to convince the, the authorities to give him his own grave okay. instead of being dumped into the common pit, which normally is the case for executed people. Okay. The, the, the scenes after the execution with all the women getting to the blood and yeah. the force, local forces being totally overwhelmed and everything mm. really disturbs a lot of people in government. Oh, yeah. So at that point, they decide, and it's voted by Parliament, that there would be no public execution anymore. Oh, it sounds like a good idea. And therefore, it becomes the last public execution. That's why it's historically important. Okay. There will be no more of public execution ever again. 
The I next mean, execution, which is a few months later, uh-huh. happens in the prison, and that's where they will always, ha- always happen from now on. But the last kind of like uh, person to be... Uh, well, the last person executed 70s, is 1977 it? or 78. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was uh, an Algerian guy who was a child murderer. He killed a whole bunch of kids. Oh, dear. And they decided, yeah, they, they, had, they hadn't been in execution for a while before him, mm. but for him, they just made a <laughs> yeah. special, special case and decided, yeah, this one is going to <laughs> yeah, be shortened. Yeah, let's blow off the cobwebs. Yeah. But now France doesn't... Uh, no, it was abolished in 81. Yeah. There was no execution between 78 and 81, and then they decided to, yeah. to just stop barbaric. doing it. Yeah. It was um, a lawyer called um, Robert Badinter, who was the justice minister at the time, mm-hmm. who managed to pass it through parliament. Okay. And he was told many times, oh, yeah, but that, there's a, that's exactly what they say in the U.S. There, there's a deterrent value to it because criminals are not going to do it. And no, he managed to argue that, no, criminals and crazy people will still kill other people. It exactly. makes absolutely no difference if no. they're going to be killed afterwards or not. No. They don't care and they probably don't even think about it. No, of course you don't. When so, you're standing, yeah. <laughs> standing the way to do a really horribly irrational thing, you're, you know, your exactly. lizard brain it takes no over. Difference. So he, his two main arguments, he had lots of arguments. I read his speech, which is quite long. It's like 30 pages. But and his two main arguments were that, first, it has no deterrent value whatsoever. No, of because if it had, there would have been no murders. <laughs> exactly. And there were plenty of them. Mm. And secondly, the chance of getting it wrong, which didn't yeah, happen exactly. too many times in France, but mm. seems to happen a lot in the US, mm. is too important. You can't, even a single yeah. innocent killed exactly. it's just by the state, just, by mistake, no. would be unacceptable. It's and just awful. The chance yeah. was too high, exactly. and people agreed that yes, maybe it was, it was too high, and better put them in prison so that at least they have a mm-hmm. chance at some point to show that they're innocent. Okay. So that's the historically significant of the mm-hmm. of the case. But the celebrity connection is that in his autobiography, Christopher Lee of Dracula, oh, surely, and also of Scaramanga. Oh, Scaramanga, yes. Superfluous third nipple, man with the golden gun. Him. And f- also fantasy fans, he was also Saruman in the uh, Lord of the Rings films. Okay. He relates in his autobiography that he was there on that day. He was at the execution. Yeah, I think I've heard of that, yeah. Yeah, I had heard of it before. He explains in an interview in 1998 on French radio, in French, he speaks really good French, it's really surprising, way, very way, little accent. Way to go. That he was there, not on purpose, but he happened to be there, so he went and watched. But he had second thoughts. He didn't, mm. he didn't know he would want to see somebody being executed. So he was getting ready to leave when everything, the 12 seconds also happened. Dear. So he was turning his back to the, um, the guillotine when it happened. So all he knows of it is the noise of the blade coming down. And he said that he heard that sound at 17 and it stayed with him all his life. Oh, thank you. I think I would. I mean, oh, yes. I, I'm entirely with him there. Oh. Yeah, I mean, imagine hearing that, you know, when you're, you know, in your teens. Oh, well, no wonder that stayed with them. Oh, that made me all shivery. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a celebrity connection of the case. Mm-hmm. And that is it for Eugene Weidman. Yeah, and I think the moral of that story is always be careful who you give your business card to. <laughs> <laughs>